Welcome back to Art of the Part. In this video, we're going to continue on with our conversation of multi-op programming in Mastercam. And we're actually done looking at the yield pop topper itself because we spent the last few videos setting up first operation and how to use dynamic milling, as well as second operation and how to use stock material or stock models uh, that will pull from the finished model of the first operation as reference for the stock setup in second operation. So in this video, we're gonna spend some time and take a look at the soft jaws because we have to mill out the negative profile of the uh, yield pop topper to hold it in second operation. Conventionally, we wouldn't be able to hold this with our hard jaws because of all this unique geometry and it wouldn't sit flat when we uh, compress the jaws against the part. So we're going to start this video off by uh, toggling off the um, toolpath from operation two if we haven't already. So I'll select op two. And then I'm going to use these little waves here to toggle off of that toolpath uh, geometry. Now I'm going to set up a new uh, machine group for our soft jaws here. So let's go over to machine and we'll grab the mill and we'll make another default mill. And we'll just title this one soft jaws. So we'll do soft jaws and we'll jump over here to the levels and the planes tab and, and set these up accordingly now. So inside the levels tab, it's going to be sad to see it go, but I no longer need the yield pop topper and it's actually going to get in the way if I try to uh, program around it in the dynamic mill. So we're going to turn this off uh, just by uh, toggling that X here for the yield pop topper. And then I no longer need my wireframe for the yield pop topper either, but you'll notice that when I try to deselect it, it's not allowing me. And that's just because it's my current active level and I just have to go to uh, activate another level as my uh, master level right now. And now I'll get the option to deselect the wireframe. So I went up here and just activated like soft jaw A-1B. Any one of these will work and then you can deselect that. However, we're going to create another wireframe level uh, for this because I'm gonna to try to trick Mastercam and the machine into thinking that these two soft jaws are actually one uh, component. So I leave a gap in between my soft jaws because I want the uh, soft jaws to hold against the part rather than holding against themselves. So I'll put like a gauge block in between here and this is like 30 thousandths. But what I need to do is that there is some geometry that is attached to the top, or the, sorry, the uh, back soft jaw and then there's some geometry that is attached to the front uh, soft jaw. So I'll have to bridge that gap uh, by using uh, a wireframe and, and making them tangent to each other. So let's go ahead and, and set up a level uh, for our uh, soft jaw um, wireframe. So I'll create a new level by using the plus button and I'll name this level uh, soft jaw wireframe. Okay. And then once again, uh, there's not going to be any entities attached to this level quite yet, but we'll go ahead and create uh, some wireframe geometry here in just a second. So let's also activate our planes for the uh, soft jaws themselves. So I'll go over here to planes, and then uh, I'm going to not use that op2 top anymore because I don't want to continue to use that same work offset. I actually want to use a new work offset in the machine for the soft jaw top. So we're going to activate the G plane as well, or sorry, the uh, yeah, G plane, the WC, S plane, and then the C and the T planes. So make sure that those are all active. And then we're gonna go over here to the tool paths. Uh, if you wanted to ever set this one up, uh, especially when you have two different components and you wanna find the origin of them, it's actually pretty easy. You're just gonna use the dynamic um, plane here and then you're just gonna grab this corner, this corner, and then it's gonna recognize uh, the origin or the center point of those two points. So pretty easy, but I won't go into it in this video. You can just use my soft draw top. Okay, let's go here ahead and uh, head over here to the toolpath group, or sorry, the uh, toolpath tab. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up our uh, stock model for these two components. And this is gonna be a little bit different than um, you know the previous operations when using the yield pop topper because we are able to just select like one component or reference the uh, first operation for second operation. So in this instance, I'm actually going to open up my properties for the soft jaws and I'm going to select on stock setup and instead of choosing, um, you know, from uh, material, we're going to choose the bounding box and we're going to select two components. So I'm going to select on this bounding box here and then we're going to make sure that we click on this little mouse here and I'm going to select this uh, back soft jaw as well as the front soft jaw. So I'll select two uh, different components in this window and then hit end selection as long as they're both yellow. And what is, this is doing, it's actually recognizing that these two components together are now gonna be one piece of stock material. 
And we're assuming that these uh, soft draw blanks have already been machined, and we just have to machine out the negative profile here. So I'm not gonna change any of the dimensions uh, in the X, Y, or Z. So let's go ahead and hit the green check mark. And then the green check mark once again. So now I can see uh, my stock model, if I go over here to the toolpaths and I turn on my stock to, uh, stock display, you'll see I have a nice red uh, solid dot, red dotted line going around both of these components. Okay, so before we can start applying toolpath, we also have to uh, import a tool library because again, it doesn't recognize or MasterCam doesn't recognize that you're going from machine to machine or you're staying in the same machine. So go into the toolpath tab. We'll go and select Tool Manager, and then we're going to have to use the uh, little file folder here with the green arrow, and we're going to look for our DMU50 tool library, hit Open, and then once again, you just got to select all these different tools, just do a bounding box over them, and we're going to paste them or copy them into the machine here. So uh, once they're all selected, go ahead and hit this arrow, and it's going to uh, transpose those into the machine itself, and then we'll select the green check mark. So now we should be uh, able to start creating some uh, toolpath geometry. However, we're going to run into that issue, like I was saying before, if we go in to use the dynamic mill, it's only going to recognize this one continuous line of geometry or this one continuous line of geometry. So what we're going to do is we're going to hop over here to the wireframe tab. And inside wireframe, just make sure that <clears throat> you're inside the correct level for a soft jaw wireframe. And then you're going to use this uh, little icon here called curve on all edges. So it's like a window with some, you know, lines that are curved on it. So click on curve on all edges. <clears throat> and then you're going to select this face and then hit end selection. And then you're going to select on or the green check mark. So it's recognizing that all this geometry here is one continuous face. And we're going to create a curve on that face. And then we'll hit the green check mark. And then we'll do the same thing for the other face. So we're going to do curve on all edges once again. Click on that, select on that face, and then select end selection, and then we'll select the green chalk mark. And this is kind of exaggerated, but you'll be able to see this a little bit easier if you want to toggle on and off your levels. However, it's not completely necessary, but if I go to my levels here and I actually turn off all these other components here in the background, you'll see that it made one uh, curve for this face and then one curve for this face. And all I have to do is I have to connect these together and get rid of these two lines. So if you still had your components on, I'll do it as if your components were still on just to make it easier. But you're going to use the trim entities, uh, which is right next to the curve all edges inside that wireframe tab. And we're going to click on this one line over here on the left. And then when you click on it, it's going to attach that trim entity and you can project it into the next instance. So in this case, I'm going to click on this line. And then you can see that it's attached to my mouse. And then on the second click, I'm going to click on this radius here. So I clicked once on this, and then I'm just going to pull my mouse up and click once, or uh, click second on this. So that's going to connect that line with that line and make them tangent with each other. And we'll do the same thing here on the other side. I'll have to move this around. And then I'll click on this line here, and then we'll click on that arc there. And that's going to project that. Uh, line to be tangent with that line there. And I should be done with my uh, trim entities now, and I can hit the green check mark. Now I just have to get rid of these two lines uh, that are intersecting um, our solid loop here because we want to exclude them and treat this as one solid pocket. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this, and then I'll hit delete. Make sure that you're selecting the line and not the part. So we're just selecting that line and hitting delete. So now if I turn my layers off again, or my levels, you'll see that I have one solid loop that's going around the negative profile of the yield pop topper in the soft jaws. You could do all this uh, if it makes it easier with those levels turned off. Uh, it's the same thing if you just want to trim entities in this view rather than having all those components on. But it's just however you want to process your uh, wireframe geometry. Okay, so now I'm going to go over here to toolpaths and I can start applying my toolpaths uh, with all these parameters set up. So let's hop over here into the toolpath tab and then I'm going to use the dynamic mill once again. So I know that I have some tight corners in here and then some uh, tight spaces that I got to get through. So I would typically finish this out with an eighth inch end mill because all these corners are 062. 
but I know that it's going to take a lot of time to uh, mill out this pocket with an eighth inch end mill. So I want to use a bigger end mill to take out some of the stock material um, from the get-go, and then I'll go ahead and finish it up with the uh, one eighth end mill here. So I'm going to go and use the two, uh, 2D dynamic mill. So inside the 2D uh, gallery, I can click on the dynamic mill. And then we're going to uh, set this up with three parameters once again. So uh, we won't be able to take advantage of the automatic regions again because there's two different components, but I'm going to select on machining regions. And then we can select on and make sure that you're choosing from the wireframe. It might default you into the solids, so just go to wireframe. And we're going to select on that wireframe loop. And it really doesn't matter what direction the arrow is facing for the dynamic mill here. Um, it's going to process that here in the background. But you'll notice that it's actually going to select through those gaps because we created that uh, wireframe geometry. So we'll hit the green check mark. So we have our machining region set up. Uh, we're going to choose to stay inside because we don't want to be outside because it would effectively tell the uh, toolpath to come and cut through the soft jaws themselves. So we actually want to stay inside this pocket. And then uh, we really don't need to set up the avoidance regions because we have it staying inside. However, it's just a good habit to get into. And we can click on the avoidance regions here. And then if I go to my solids, I can choose, uh, I can deselect the loop and just choose the face. And I can just select this face and this face and then hit the green check mark. Again, it's just good practice to get into. It shouldn't come into play, but we'll hit the green check mark. And again, three different parameters we set up, the machining region, stay inside, and then the avoidance region of those two faces. We'll hit the green check mark. And then we'll go over here to the tool. And like I said, we're going to use a bigger tool uh, than the eighth inch to uh, you know, hog out some of this material. We're going to use the uh, 250 end mill now. So let's go and find the 250 end mill, which is located right here in tool position 5. I'll do a 250 rough end mill. And then I'm going to go over here to cut parameters. And then my stock to leave on the marble walls, I'm going to leave, you know, five thousandths. Okay. And then we'll go over here to depth cuts. And if we look at our Excel sheet, I can look at my 250 end mill. And that should read as a 125 max depth uh, cut of pass. So we're going to change our depth cut here to 0.125. And then we'll come down here to linking parameters. Uh, we're going to uh, make this absolute, 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 absolute. And then once again, we'll make the top of the stock, um, you know, one of these edges. And then the depth, we're going to now choose... Um, the face down here or one of the edges of that wireframe because we want it to go that entire length. So I'll choose one of those uh, corners there and then just make sure as a good habit to come into the planes tab and uh, register that this is um, on the correct uh, working coordinate system that you want. So this is soft jaw top, soft jaw top, soft jaw top. So if this is still uh, reading as um, soft or sorry, op2, you can come in here into this uh, select WCS plane and then select the soft jaw if you need to. But just make sure that you're on that soft jaw top all the way through. And then hit the green check mark. And we're going to see that this is actually going to generate some geometry for me, our toolpath geometry for me, but it's not going to complete um, the entire pass because the tool won't be able to go into this uh, little uh, area here, or it won't be able to come into an even tighter area right here. So this is helpful because it's removing the material um, in such a way that it would uh, create some relief uh, for the one eighth end uh, one in, uh, one eighth end mill, so it's not doing all the work. So we're going to create another dynamic mill. However, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I already set one dynamic mill up, and I'm just going to change some of the parameters in it. So if you wanted to, you can go ahead and you know dynamic mill and select all your parameters once again. But in this instance, I'm just going to uh, highlight or select my 2D dynamic mill for the 250 uh, end mill that I just set up. Right click it and then copy it. And then I'm going to come beneath it and I'm going to uh, select paste. So I just pasted another uh, copy of that toolpath, but I'm going to change the tool out. So we're going to open up this uh, additional toolpath that we just created for the 2D dynamic mill. And inside parameters, I'm going to change just a handful of uh, dimensions here. So I'm going to go in here to tool, and then I'm going to change it from a 250 end mill, and I'm going to go all the way down here and find my 125 end mill. That is going to be the 16th tool. And I'm going to change this uh, note to be 125 finish end mill. 
And then we'll also come in here to cut parameters and we're gonna change our stock flavon wall to zero and zero. And then we'll go over here to uh, depth cuts because it was still uh, remembering that the depth of cut was um, 0.125 from the uh, from the 250 end mill. And we're gonna change this. And if we look here inside of our uh, Excel spreadsheet, we can find the 125 end mill and my max depth of cut is gonna be about you know, 062. And this is gonna be important, especially when you're doing like these internal pockets here and it's got a helix down and cut in. We don't wanna go too deep. So we'll make this 0 0.0625. And then we'll go over here to linking parameters and this should all be the same. Absolute, 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 absolute. And then with our depth of point, our negative 0 0.34375. One thing that I do wanna check, um, used to be where if you select another tool, it would update your speeds and feeds. However, I do want to make sure that it is pulling the right speed and feed so I can right click on my tool here, the 125 end mill, and then I can go ahead and reinitialize uh, feeds and speeds. Yeah, so it did update from the speeds and feeds that I had uh, previously set up in my Excel sheet here. So I set that up in Mastercam. So it was still using the 250 uh, speeds and feeds. And then one thing that I want to make mention of before I hit the green check mark, and this is going to be really cool, is that I'm actually going to force these two tool paths to communicate with each other. So if I just hit the green check mark here, um, and I'll just show you as a bad example, but if I just hit the green check mark here, I'm going to toggle off this uh, 2D high, uh, this the 250 um, 2D dynamic mill. And you'll notice that it's going to try to run that uh, one eighth end mill in all the spots that were previously cut away in the uh, 250 end mill. So this is kind of like a waste of time. It'd be cutting error in those instances. So we're going to try to tell the 250, or sorry, the 125 end mill that the 250 end mill cut away this pocket here, this pocket here, and this pocket here. So if you go back here into, and I'll just do a verify here one second and see what the time difference is. So that's going to take six minutes to cut, um, all in all. But if I come in here and I go to parameters, and then inside the parameters of that uh, 1 8 inch end mill, if we go into stock, this is where I want you to follow me again, uh, we actually want to recognize rest material. So if we click on rest material, we can choose to recognize any toolpath from any of the groups above, or we can actually stay within the machine group that we're working in, which is going to be uh, machine group only. So hit that drop down menu for machine group only. And now you'll recognize that when I hit the green check mark, it'll take a second to uh, calculate. And I'll zoom out here. It's going to recognize that there were areas that were previously cut away from uh, with the um, 250 dynamic mill. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to run these two together uh, inside of my verify. So I'll go to Toolpath Group 3, or sorry, uh, Soft Draw um, Operation, and then we'll go and select Verify. And we should be able to see, and I'll kind of zoom this out a little bit, and then hit the Play button, that it's going to get these with the 250, and then instead of cutting air with the 125, it's only going to recognize the areas that still have stock material in them, which is very advantageous, and it's actually going to cut down on some of our cutting time. So pretty good stuff there. And we can actually have the toolpaths communicate with each other. So I'm going to fast forward this. It's going to do its final finishing pass there. And then we can see, and this is important as well, if we set up our proper tool library, our allotted depth to cut, as well as where the shank is and where the tool is sticking up. So I just like to make sure that you know all of my tool geometry are, is going to match what's going to be in the machine uh, so I can catch any errors like that. OK. So let's go ahead and X out of this. And the last thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to apply a chamfer on the top edge of that. So again, this is kind of what I was talking about where you make machine configurations inside SOLIDWORKS. And this is a good example because I want this to be one continuous uh, chamfer. And we're going to have to do this in a more unconventional way. Uh, previously, we would be able to, especially if we had 3D geometry, uh, hit the drop down menu of this expand gallery and then select the model chamfer. But when you're inside model chamfer, you'll notice that when you try to change geometry, there's not the option to select the wireframe, which is what we created to connect these two pieces of geometry underneath. So what we're going to do now is we're going to utilize the, and I don't want to keep that, we're going to select no. 
we're going to utilize the uh, contour uh, milling pattern. So we're going to select on contour here in the 2D gallery, and then we're going to select on the wireframe because we still have that wireframe underneath. And again, if it's kind of hard to see uh, your toolpath here, you can always exit out of this and toggle it off. But I can see that I have my toolpath located right in that gap, and I can grab, or sorry, that wireframe right in that gap, so I can grab that. And it'll uh, accept that as one continuous chain. And then I'll hit the green check mark. Okay, so while you're in the contour, again, we're not in model chamfer, we're in contour, we're going to select our tool, and then we're going to go over here to the chamfer cutter, and then we're going to create a chamfer edge note. And then you're going to want to come down here to cut parameters. So this is where things are going to be just a little bit different. So typically we would be able to just like run this uh, as is. If you're going to be like doing logos and you want to be at the center of the tool, you could turn this off uh, for the cutter compensation. But we're going to leave it on computer. And then we're going to choose the uh, contour type. We're going to hit the drop down menu for 2D. And we're actually going to select that to be 2D chamfer. So we're going to put in our chamfer geometry just like how we would uh, if we were doing a model chamfer for 3D and give this a value of 0 0.03125 and then the bottom of the offset will do the same 0 0.03125. Uh, my depths really don't have to worry about that because it's just going to be one cut around. Lead in, lead out. Uh, it might be better to you know turn this lead in, lead out off. Uh, we'll see how it approaches, especially when it's an internal pocket, but I might come back in here and turn this off in uh, when the toolpath is generated. Okay, then we're going to come in here to linking parameters, and this might be a little bit confusing, but uh, we'll just make sure that this is all reading absolute, absolute, absolute. But instead of the depth being all the way down there, uh, we've already set the depth up inside of our cutting parameters to be at this level. So we're just going to zero this out. So you can either hit depth and hit the top face here, or I can just type in zero and then uh, make sure that you're reading in the right planes, soft jaw top, all the way across, and then we'll hit the green check mark. Okay, so let's see if this generated for me. I'm just going to go ahead and select my soft jaw group and then hit uh, verify once again. And then we will, I'll just make this fast so it goes all the way through. And then run my verify, see how my toolpaths are. Okay, so it doesn't like this for some reason. Let me go ahead and see if I can change that or update it. So I'll come back here into my 2D giant geometry, come back in here. I might have to make it a little bit smaller of a pass here because it might think that it's like intersecting with itself. So let's just make it like 0 0.0125 and 0 0.0125. And then hit the green check mark. And let's see if that actually worked. Maybe it was too tight of an area there. Okay. Yep, so it's just recognizing that it was a little bit too tight. So you can play around with that geometry and the offsets, uh, but now that chamfer ran all the way around that edge. So this is pretty cool here because again, uh, Mastercam is thinking that these two soft jaws are one component, so I don't have to mill them independently. And even if I was milling them independently, it would be pretty difficult to you know, lock uh, the, the front and the back in the correct positions to make sure that they are you know, holding the tight tolerances that we're wanting to hold for our, our soft jaws. So this is really, uh, really cool and really advantageous, and especially that we can take advantage of the um, tool paths and how they communicate with each other. Uh, so you can pull the stock material that's left over, uh, especially in these dynamics. And when we start getting to uh, more 3D profiles, we can use the OptiRough in the same way as Dynamic Mill, where it can recognize that stock material has previously been uh, removed. So let's go ahead and save this. Um, I'm going to name this like, you know, you can name it as your yield pop topper, but I'm going to name mine yield pop topper, and I'll just name this soft jaws for me. And then once again, uh, you can <clears throat> export uh, the programs uh, as you need. So soft jaw, you can select that soft jaw group and then hit G1, and then it can generate um, all this soft jaw group here. And I'll show you how many lines of code are running, especially in this dynamic mill, because it's a little bit more complex than what we were running before uh, inside of the uh, yield pop topper when we were just roughing it out. But look how many lines of code are generated using that dynamic mill. 
So again, really, really powerful and impressive stuff that we can take advantage of in uh, Mastercam here. So um, the order of operations here we would be we would mill you know first operation, um, and then we'd go and we mill the soft jaws, and then we'd mill second operation because we need these soft jaws to mill the uh, second operation. So I hope that was helpful in understanding the entire process inside of Mastercam and how to program this. Um, and you can always, you know, toggle on and off between your different uh, programs by, you know, selecting uh, soft jaws and then toggling it off, or then coming into Op2 and then, you know, turning that on. And then if you respectively, you would have to come into your levels and turn them on and off if you needed them. But we're going to end the video there. I'm going to save this and we'll catch you in the next one.